give me a chance to do that. This is our fourth week. As of the end of today, we will be halfway through our class. And I should let you all know that both for this class and the other classes, I am going to try next week to start having some of the study materials available to you in preparation for the final. Which means next week I will give you uh, content that is for the first four weeks that we've been over and then each week I will give you more so that, uh, and the, the plan is that in the eighth week we will spend the first hour in lecture and the second hour will be the final exam. Anybody is free to take the final exam, but it is required for anybody taking a certificate or a degree. It will be uh, multiple choice or true-false. It will be pretty straightforward in that regard. And everything on it will be from material I give you. Now, what I'll give you next week, in other words, will be uh, from the last four weeks of class, or the first four weeks of class, rather. Here are just sort of statements. Here are the things that you need to know. And then when you come for the test, it will be in a question and answer or a uh, true, false, simple answer kind of thing. And how many questions? Uh, uh, 800. <laughs> I don't know yet. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how many questions. If it, it, it's not going to be anything, I mean, some, something you can take in an hour. So, um, Betty, could you help me? Because sure. you're in the row there. And there's three of those there. If you would pass these out as you go back, that'd be helpful. And three walls. A little bit of business. Oh, give me one of those uh, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> All right. People have been asking me about the other classes, and I actually have sort of simplified and clarified, I think, the schedule for the next, uh, the rest of the Instituto classes. The simple version of this is when we finish this class on the 2nd of November, we will not meet the rest of November or December. We will pick back up the first full week in uh, January, which starts January 7th. The simple version of this is our classes will be January and February and then take March off. April and May will be classes and then we take um, uh, June off, July, August will be classes. This time we will take September and October off because Carolyn and I are going, I'm speaking on a, a cruise in October in uh, talk, teaching them, it's a, a cruise called Footsteps of Faith, so I will be doing that in October. And then when we come back, we will have November and early December will be a seven week term, but we can get everything in. And then we will pick back up again the first year. Now, what this means is that all of the courses for the full boat Master of uh, Biblical Studies and Ministry, or Master of Theology and Ministry, will take two years total. Less than that, if you're going for less, yeah, there should be plenty, um, plenty more. Um, and as you can see, the first fall term 2012 is what we're in right now. So the next term will begin January 7th and continue through March 1st. And the three classes in the next term in January and February uh, will be New Testament Survey, Old New Testament Theology, and the Christian Spiritual Disciplines. Prayer, meditation, etc. Okay. And then you can see down through here. Again, as I've said before, because this is our first go through, I do reserve the right to make some changes. In fact, there are a couple of class changes that I've made in here. Instead of doing um, Romans to Revelation, I've decided to do Pauline epistles and then other New Testament writings, which would be Hebrews to Revelation. Okay. Any questions about that? Since you all have been asking, I wanted to put that in your hands. Okay, so this will be slightly different. Um, part of what has happened, again, to be completely honest with you all, is as I got into this, I had done a lot of the preliminary work and study and chosen the books. It's taking me more time to prepare the weekly stuff, you know, like the presentations and the two hours of lecture, than I expected. And so one of the reasons for the schedule being like this is that means I have one month out of three in order to get ahead and make sure that we're, we're ready to go, rather than me have to spend as much time during the classes, you know, in preparation for this week's classes to get them ready. Does that make sense? Yes. And I think I can do a better job for you all that way. Um, okay. How to study the Bible. Let's get back to that. Uh, I just uh, forgotten I wanted to hand this out to you. And if anybody does have any questions, let me know about that. Today in our fourth week, we are looking at inductive Bible study, which is our first application session. My intention is this week and the next two weeks in this class, um, we will be looking at application. How do you actually do this? 
how to study the Bible is the name of our class, it wouldn't make sense for this all to be theoretical. We have to get down to very practical kinds of application. Today, I want to deal with kind of the core level, or the basic level, of how to study the Bible, and that is inductive Bible study. Um, so, what is inductive Bible study? That's the question. Inductive Bible study is a systematic, systematic being an important word there, a systematic approach to studying the Bible in which you draw out meaning and understanding through a careful examination of the text itself, rather than by depending on the thoughts, uh, depending upon the thoughts and comments of Bible scholars or others. Inductive Bible study means you take the Bible and you ask God, the Holy Spirit, to speak to you to give you understanding of what this says and what it means and how you apply it to your life, rather than starting out by going to some commentary or something else and having someone else tell you what it means. It allows the Bible to speak for itself to you. And we believe this works because we believe that God desires to be involved in that process with you and help you with that. Another way to think of this is that inductive Bible study seeks to allow God's Word to speak to us directly using the Bible text only with guidance from the Holy Spirit. So inductive means you go to the text and let it speak to you. Deductive would be that you, you uh, start with presumptions or with content or with something from outside and you bring them to the text. Um, it would be the difference in, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, that uh, analogy later as we get into it. Does that, do you understand that? Do you understand what we mean by inductive Bible study? All right, I want to go through steps to inductive Bible study. A few of these steps I mentioned to you earlier when we talked about the right way to approach Bible study, but now we're talking about a specific approach. As you've been reading the two books, the K. Arthur book, uh, The New How to Study the Bible, Your Bible, and the Rick Warren book, the K. Arthur book is entirely about this process, about inductive Bible study. The Rick Warren book deals with a number of different kinds of Bible studies or approaches to Bible study, most of which are intended to be inductive, but some of them are not. Some of them start with outside sources. But the K. Arthur book is entirely about this, inductive Bible study. If you've ever been involved with some of the Christian organizations like Young Life or InterVarsity, Carolyn worked with InterVarsity for many years, they are very big on inductive Bible study. This is the, this is the approach that most of those organizations will teach their staff uh, you know, or people who are involved in, in their ministry, okay? So, the steps. The first step is you need to select a Bible text to study. Don't pick the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, the point here is, pick some section of Scripture that you can handle or deal with. Um, ideally, it's a book, but when you, when you first get started with this, don't pick Isaiah or Psalms, all right? Don't pick one of the long or Romans, Pick a smaller book, or if you want to look at a longer, at a larger book, then pick a, a section of it, a chapter. And I guess I should say at this point that some of what I am going to teach you today, tell you today, is my own approach to this. I've taken, I've taken things from K. Arthur and from Rick Warren and from a lot of other different sources, but this is what I think makes sense. And I'll tell you why I've done that. Why don't I just get up here and teach you? K. Arthur's approach. Well, there are some things about it that I think are not practical. And when I say practical, I mean there are things about it that most of you are not willing to do. It doesn't help me or anybody else to teach you a system which you're not going to actually use because it's too complicated. And, and, and some of you will. And so you need to know, and I'll give you some of that background. But this is the International Inductive Study Bible. This is done by Precepts Ministries, which is K. Arthur's organization. They have a new um, inductive Bible study, which this one used the internet, new international version, the version I choose and recommend. The new one they have, I think, uses New American Standard. But one of the things, to give you an example, is they suggest when you go through a passage, and this, by the way, was a book that a uh, Bible of Carolyn's father had, was given as a gift by uh, her mother. There's an inscription in the front, to my sweetheart, Rick. Um, so, but in it, they recommend here that whenever you, that you have a symbol for all the major words, like every time you come to the word God, you, you put a triangle over it, representing the Trinity. Every time you come to love, you put a, 
a heart over it. Every time you come to law, you put like two tablets over it. Every time you come to repent, you put a reverse arrow, and then you use different colors for each one. I recommend that you try that. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm real honest with you. I, and the point is, I don't want you to, to I, I, this is great, and this is what Kay Arthur recommends. In fact, in one place in Kay Arthur's book, she says, um, maybe don't do that all the time. What's page, that? Page 30. Okay. <laughs> do you have a special symbol for page 30? <laughs> um, yeah. And again, I think for some of you, some of you will really get into that, and I really recommend you try it. Okay? Where you, you go that whole hog on this, where you have different colors and different symbols. Yeah, this is exactly the same thing, the bottom of page 30. Um, but I don't want you to start doing this and go, oh, come on, I'm getting tired of drawing little icons and stuff. You know, if you, if there's a danger that that becomes the point rather than understanding what the Bible is telling you. Okay? You see where I'm coming from? I'm not picking on them because I think this is still a good approach. For some of you, this will really enrich it for you, and so I recommend you try. I'm not going to do that, because I don't think you have to do that to get to where you want to go. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. I thought that I would not be strong enough to be able to do that. <laughs> Rosie said she thought she wouldn't live long enough to be able to do that, so okay. Amen. So what I'm going to suggest to you today is my own version of this, some of it taken from K. Arthur's material, which is still really good. And those of you who get excited about that, go for it. Because a lot of people use that, and a lot of people do very well with it. And so I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but I'm also going to give you some kind of an out if, it, if that doesn't work for you. All right? So first, select a Bible text to study. Ideally, a book. And when you start getting into this, pick a shorter book. You know, like some of the later letters of Paul, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, or Wonderful, you know, any, any of those kinds of things. Um, you know, some of the shorter prophets, if you get into like um, Habakkuk, or Malachi, or Jonah, for instance, those are wonderful books. Select a passage, and then begin with, once you've selected it, begin with prayer. I've talked about this several times. Ask God to guide you to learn more about Him, and to come to love you more. You notice I didn't say... Pray to God that you learn everything you can learn. Because the point here is not information, it's transformation. God did not give us, to, to paraphrase D.L. Moody's comment, God did not, did not give us the Bible in order, to, in order to increase our store of knowledge, but rather to change our lives. And so pray that God will help you do that. To learn from it, grow from it, change your life because of it. Be transformed by God's Word, not just gain information. You have to gain information as a start, but that's not the end result. You're, you're, that's not the whole point. The third thing, then, is to read through the text completely. Depending upon how much you have, read it two or three times. You know, Bob was talking earlier about the hard part about this. Is He took the, the lesson very seriously, which I think Kay Arthur says read it five times, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Read through it five times. Okay, you've chosen. You feel like God is telling you to take the Gospel of John. Read through it five times. Okay, that's going to take a while. I would recommend that whatever text you have, you read through it at least twice. If it's a long text, read through it once, slowly and thoughtfully, and then read through it a little more quickly or skim it. You know, again, I'm trying to be real practical with you all. Not have you get frustrated and not want to do this. But the point is, read through it once or twice or three times or four times or five times, whatever it takes for you to get a basic sense of familiarity with it. I said to you or last week, I think it was, or two weeks ago, the first thing that people, all of us, need to gain is a basic familiarity with Scripture. What's in there? Before we can begin to get into some of the, the more specific kinds of doctrinal understandings, etc. Well, the best way that you can get an idea of what's in there in terms of overall familiarity is to spend some time reading it. I have recommended to you the most critical thing you can do is to spend Sometime every day, just reading, just reading, just letting it flow through you. And I, I was pleased that in the preface that I just read to the message, Eugene Peterson says the same thing. The first thing is to just get to reading it before you even think about studying it. But for those of us who are committed to our faith, and you would be or you wouldn't be sitting in these chairs right now, we then need to go to the next step and begin to study it. But read through the text thoroughly 
at least twice, you know, read through it really, you know, really thoroughly once, read through it a second time. Um, if you don't feel like you've got it, then read through it some more. But read the text that you selected. If you, if you select, which is what I recommend to you early on, either a very short book or a chapter, or, you know, a section of a book, then yes, read through it several times, because you can do that in, in a sitting even. The fourth thing you then need to do is develop the context. Context, as K. Arthur does a good job, is con means with, all right? So the context is what is the stuff that goes with the text, meaning um, why was it written, how was it written, who wrote it, where was it written, all of the kind of background understanding, which actually is higher criticism if you want to know, uh, it's, it's the, the sense of what is the context, what is the environment in which this book was written and in, in which it existed originally. Because our goal is to try to go as much as possible to get back to the original meaning that was intended. When God had the Apostle Paul write to the Thessalonians, um, which much of First and Second Thessalonians is about the eschatology, about the last things. Did you did you ever notice that every chapter of First Thessalonians, there are five chapters in First Thessalonians. Every chapter ends with a reference to the second coming of Jesus. Five times Paul emphasizes that in that one short book. So to understand a little bit about the environment that the Thessalonians were experiencing, they were young believers. Paul had been forced to leave there before he really had a chance to teach them much or get them up to speed. They had been misled about um, the second coming of Jesus. Many of them thought he had already come and they missed it. And so that's what that book is all about. If you know that, who wrote it, who he's writing it to, and a little bit about what the situation was, think other things start falling into place as you start reading it, which is one of the reasons you have a study Bible and not just a reading Bible. Okay, so. Get the context as much as possible. You're not always going to be able to get, and I'm going to, I'm going to break these down in more detail in a minute. This is just the list. The fifth thing is observation. What does the text say? What does it actually say? And I'm going to give you some kind of guidelines to, to deal with that as we go. The sixth thing is interpretation. What does it mean? Okay, this is what Paul said in this letter, or John said in this letter, or whatever. But what did they mean? Well, you know, what, what's behind that other than just the words? The sixth, the seventh thing, which is what I add, because I think it's important, is not just number six, interpretation, what does it mean, but what I call meditation. What does it mean to me? In other words, it's thinking about, well, what's my situation? And how does this speak to me? Just in terms of interpreting, how is it particular to my situation that I need to interpret it? What does it mean to me? And then seventh, the application. How does this change my life? What do I do with this now? What does God want me to do with this to apply it to my life so that I can become more of what God wants me to? All right? Any questions about any of those? We're going to unwrap all of that today. Questions? Boy, I'm either really good or you guys are really sleepy. I'm not quite really sure what it is. Or both. <laughs> okay. Ask, when I talk about asking the right questions, I gave you this before. How many of you all studied journalism in school or ever had a journalism class? Carolyn in the back has a degree. Okay, several of you. What are the questions I tell you to ask in journalism? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Those are the basic journalistic questions. In fact, back when journalism was really considered a legitimate artistic form of expression, uh, <laughs> they... It was believed that, unless it's an editorial, those are the questions you always needed to answer in the lead paragraph. In the first paragraph, you need to say, you know, the local IHEEC authorities responded to uh, an alarm at Banco Mare at 9 o'clock on Thursday morning, and when arriving, they discovered that money had been taken out of the ATM, um, suspects are being pursued. All right, that's like the lead set, the paragraph. And if you, un if you unwrap that, I wasn't even thinking about who, what, where, when, why, and how. But that will give you who, who responded, where did they respond, what was the situation, what had happened, uh, how did it appear, you know, etc. You get all of that in there. Well, those are the questions to try to get at the meaning behind something. In effect, being a good student of the Bible means that you're a detective. You're a detective or a, a good journalist. A good journalist is a good detective, too. And so you need to learn 
to look at the scripture and ask those kinds of questions in order to figure out what the meaning is behind it. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. We're going to give you an example of that as we go along. All right, I want to right now. Betty, I'm going to put you to work again. Okay. You happen to be close to me, but close, closer to the back. Uh, We are going to spend some time looking at the first chapter of the Gospel of John because it's probably my favorite chapter of the Bible. And I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah. It's also not just my favorite, but the reason it's my favorite is because it's perhaps the most significant chapter in all the Gospel. So much of our understanding of Jesus and our doctrine as a Christian church come from this chapter. I want everybody to read this right now. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Read through this first chapter of John. For those of you who are more comfortable in Spanish than English, perhaps Guillermo, if you want to read it in your Bible in Spanish, that's okay too. First chapter of the Gospel of John. still reading that I'm handing something else out, but don't look at this until you finish reading. Some of you downloaded the notes and so you've already got this, but this one will be bigger.
to make sure you all are reading the Bible is to bring you in here and hand you something to make you read it while I watch. <laughs> Okay, you've now read one of the most important passages. If you're just finishing, keep going. You've now read one of the most important chapters in the whole New Testament. What do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a it's, it's, it's like a love letter that um, God is coming to take us out of darkness. Right. It's if you compare this to the start of the other three Gospels. You immediately get a sense of how John is different than the first three. The first three Gospels, as I've said many times, are called synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic, which means same seeing. They all are pretty much giving a record of Jesus and what Jesus did, the miracles, the parables, all of that, and, and very similar to one another. John, however, as you get from this first chapter especially, is less concerned about the events of Jesus' life Although he, he gives us, then the meaning behind it. John is a theological treatise on the nature of Jesus, and it starts right here. Okay, now, I want us to spend some time actually doing an inductive Bible study on this chapter, especially on the first part of this chapter. Um, let me start by asking you, well, well, let's look at the sheet that I gave you, this thing. Some of you printed it out because I did put it online so that you can have access to it and print out your own copies later. This is my own creation, adapted from a number of other pieces that you can get from different ministries, different places. If you go on the internet and you do a search for inductive Bible study, you will get a mountain of different kinds of materials. All of them slightly different. Every ministry, unto thy word is one of them. Precepts ministry, K. Arthur's ministry, and on and on. They all have kind of their own versions of it. Uh, I've given you, taken bits and pieces, but my own sense of something that I want you to be able to use as a tool. Front and back, one sheet of paper. There's something magical about having everything on one sheet of paper. So that you don't have to, you know, it gives you a focus that you don't get if you get multiples of things. Um, this document, you'll notice that, and I think I have, well, um, we'll come back to that, but this is what the document looks like. At the top, I've got the first three steps, select a book or passage to study, which we talked about, pray that God would direct and teach you, which we prayed before we started class, read the passage through at least twice or more, I'm not going to make you read this twice because of just, the, you know, the time here in class, but um, and most of you have probably read this at some time in the past, I would hope. If you haven't read the first chapter of the Gospel of John before, then you must have just gotten saved. <laughs> okay. Um, and step four is then to use this chart as a way of sort of walking yourself through the inductive study of the Gospel of John, or the first chapter of the Gospel of John, because it'll help, it'll prompt you with questions, it'll give you something to respond to. Now, does everybody have a pen or a pencil? If you came to class without something to write with, then, yeah, then smack him, Guillermo. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> um, always bring something to write with. You'll notice that I put in here the, also, date, passage of scripture, translation used. There may be some time in the future that you come back to your notes, because remember, you're going to be able to three-hole punch this and put it in a notebook, remember? We talked about having a loose-leaf notebook that you could work with. If you use these kinds of charts, or some other version of it, you can even create your own version based upon this if there's a different thing, a different way to do it that's more comfortable for you, but have something, and you'll, you'll see as we go along the value of this. But when did you do this study? What scripture are you studying? And maybe even what translation you use. And so that, so that at some time in the future, you don't come back to this and go, wow, that doesn't read right. What's wrong with that? Then you'll know that you were staying at a cousin's house and they only had the, you know, the original Revised Standard Version, and so it didn't read. Whatever. I think that's valuable just to make a quick note. The first thing that you then do after that, which were, was on that list I had for you, is um, determine the context for this passage. And as you'll see from the notes there, using the passage itself and the study Bible, you notice I said the study Bible, because you all have study Bibles, right? Um, study Bible introductory material, answer the following. 
some of these questions will be immediately evident in the passage you're reading. If you're reading one of Paul's letters, in almost every case, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to the church at Corinth, or whatever it is. Paul almost always identifies himself. So right there in the passage, you're going to know who it is. Um, so if, if not, which is not the case here, John never identifies himself by name in the Gospel of John. He sometimes refers to himself as the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, as, a, as, a, as a modest way of both acknowledging that Jesus is love for him and keep from using his proper name. So who wrote this book? I want us to actually go through these and let's, let's work with it. Who's got their study Bible handy? All right. So, um, what, oh, one other thing I should mention as I go along. When I said read through the passage at least twice, um, one of the things you might try, tell your family you're doing this, um, is reading it out loud. I want to say tell your family you're doing that so they don't think that it's finally getting to you. Um, you will remember I told you before that we learn in different ways. The things that you take in with your eyes by seeing, which is what, when you read, the things you take in with your ears when you hear, the things that you, when you write, all of those anchor in your mind in different ways. The advantage that you have by reading scripture out loud sometimes is that you not only are seeing it with your eyes and processing it that way, but your ears also hear your own voice saying the words. Sometimes meaning, depth of meaning can come out from reading scripture out loud that you won't get if you just read it silently. Man, careful with that fly in your skin. It's coming after me. Uh, that's going to look good on camera. <laughs> So try reading it out loud. Maybe read through it once quiet, you know, silently, and then read it out again out loud because you will get a depth of understanding that way that you might not get otherwise. Um, so context for the passage. Using the, let's turn to the introductory material on John. Just to give you, I want you to see how to use that. Now, we are not looking here to get a, get understanding or somebody else's idea about what the text says. We're going to get to that in a minute. We're just looking at background information now. So looking at the introductory material is fine for this. Who wrote this book? Who's the author? John. John. Okay. Which John? Apostle. John the Apostle. There are other Johns. There's John the Baptist. And by the way, here's an example. If you were to see John and you go, wait a minute, John's mentioned in the first chapter. Is he talking about himself? No. Well, then you need to figure out the difference between John the Baptist, who is referred to in the first chapter of this book, and John the Apostle, who wrote this book. Not the same person. When you, when you read like in the NIV Study Bible, if you're using the NIV Study Bible, you're going to be on page 1756. Under author, the author is the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was prominent in the early church, etc., 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 and it will give you all the outline to this. And if you still have a question about it, then, you know, when we get into the text, it will explain who, which John is being referred to. But the author is John the Baptist. Write that in on this sheet. John, okay. the author, John. I'm sorry, John the Apostle. John the Apostle. We're not aware of anything John the Baptist wrote. To whom was it written? Who is the audience? Okay, what does it say? Read it out. So it's a it's a broad letter. It's not intended for just one place. Like the book of Romans was written to the church in Rome. The first and second Thessalonians was written to the church in Thessalonica. This gospel was written primarily Gentile believers and seeking unbelievers. Do you know what the difference is in this and the book of Matthew then? The Gospel of Matthew? Matthew was written to Jews. And the reason we know that is because Matthew makes all of these references to the Jewish culture and history and, and Jewish law, and he doesn't bother to explain them. Because everybody who reads it would have understood what all those things were referring to. Matthew had a Jewish audience that he was writing to. Uh, Luke was writing, uh, well, Mark primarily to Gentiles, Luke primarily to Gentiles. It's believed that John was written to Gentile believers and seeking unbelievers of both kinds. So it's not as distinctive. It's a little broader. That tells you who he's writing to. 
The reason that's valuable is, for instance, if you were doing the same process with Matthew, and you start getting into the text, and he's got all these Jewish references, and it, it would help you to understand them if you knew that the people he was writing to were all Jewish. Okay? The third point, who or what was it written about? What is the subject? Jesus. Okay, Jesus. That's pretty safe to say that's the subject of any of the books in the New Testament, but, you know. Um, <laughs> In the study Bible, you've got that little uh, quick look at the bottom. When I say what's the subject, another way you could ask that is what is the theme? What is it, what's the theme? The introduction of Jesus to the Gentiles. Okay. More, more specific? Go ahead. It's almost like an announcement for the in the world. Right. Um, as they say in the study uh, point, which is important, G uh, John presents Jesus as the Word, capital W, Word, Logos. When you start studying this, when we get into the text itself, you'll learn more about what that means. The Word, the Messiah, which is a, he a Jewish word, Mashiach, it means the Anointed One. The same word as Christ in Greek. The incarnate Son of God who has come to reveal the Father and bring eternal life to all who believe in Him. That's the theme, that's the, that's the subject. Introducing Jesus as the eternal word, the Messiah, the one who is to bring us back to God, to save us and give us eternal life for everyone who believes in him. Now, again, the Gospel of John is wide sweeping, both in its audience and in its theme. You would get a much more specific theme if you were dealing with Thessalonians, for instance, or um, you know, Philemon. Philemon was written to a slave owner to encourage him to take his, his runaway slave back. Very specific topic. Questions? You will stop me if you've got questions about this, right? And you are filling out your little paper. When did the events of the book occur? What's the timeline? 8050 50 to 85. No, that's when it was written. That's when it was written, 80-50 to, to um, 80, 85. Three, there, there are two years before he was crucified. Okay. Well, it starts out. You know what, what, you, what you just read. What's the what's the first Jesus reference? His baptism. His baptism. It's not his birth. Right. Okay. The other gospels start with his birth, pretty much. In general estimate. The Gospel of John. The first we hear about Jesus being. I mean, to what to what extent you could say. Um, when did the events of this book occur? Well, started in eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the beginning. It started when Genesis started, which is, it didn't. It's always been, okay, really. Um, so, but, for the most part, this begins at Jesus' adulthood. So we're talking about A.D. Um, 27 or so to A.D. 30. We don't know for sure exactly. Uh, Jesus was not born at zero and died at 33, okay? The, the calendars got all messed up, the AD and BC. Uh, but it would be, this book covers, for the most part, a range of probably about three years, which is from Jesus' baptism, the start of his ministry, until his death. But it also has this, this extraordinary theological prologue, which starts within the beginning, the same place that Genesis starts. Okay, from where was the book written? Source location. We don't know. See, I, I'm asking you all these questions. Some of them you won't have an answer to. It's probably Ephesus. We were talking in our Bible study class. Um, uh, Bob, was it you that said that you had read something about that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had lived in Ephesus with John, which is probably true, because Jesus told them from the cross to take care of each other. And John, we know for a fact, lived in Ephesus, was the, and, and from there he was exiled to the Patmos for a while, then came back to Ephesus, which is where he died. And so probably Mary was there. We think this was written during the time when, Jesus, when, when John either was on Patmos, which we know was when he wrote the Revelation, or he wrote it from Ephesus either right before that or right after that. So we believe that's true, but you know what? That's, we don't know that for a fact, and it's not particularly relevant here. Some of Paul's writings, for instance, to know that he was in prison at the time he wrote it. He was in prison in Rome or, you know, uh, the various other circumstances in his life. 
If you know that, then it helps you understand why he says some of the things he says and what, what the meaning is behind it. Okay? So knowing where it got written from can be valuable. Here, probably Ephesus, we don't know for a fact. Where did the primary events take place? What's the location? Well, let's, we're just looking at that first chapter there. What, what happened? Where's the first chapter taking place? See Galilee. Okay, Galilee. It's up north. Um, but more than that, where did Jordan. Jesus get baptized? Jordan. In the Jordan River. John pretty much takes place, other than the, you know, the theological prologue. It starts with John the Baptist at the Jordan River, which was not too far from Jerusalem, because all of Jerusalem was coming out to him. Then we have um, Jesus up in Galilee. We have the calling of the, of the disciples, the apostles. And then you have some ministry in the north. And then you have Jesus in Jerusalem. If we were doing the whole book, that would be pretty clear. Because we're just doing the first chapter, you will not have had all of that. But if you look at just this first chapter, you can see the, the, the prologue, which is from verse 1 to verse 14, which is the, the, the discussion about the Word. And then from there, um, if you keep reading in that first chapter, it's helpful to sort of think of this in sections. The second ch section of this, which starts in verse 15, John testifies concerning him, it goes on, now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. So there's this scene at the Jordan River where priests and Levites from Jerusalem are coming out and questioning him about this. And John says, I baptize you with water. And then it even says in verse 28, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. So there's that little, you know, interrogation session at Bethany. Then starting with verse 29, we, we have another little pericope, and there's a word that's it's useful to know. Pericope means a little section of scripture that sort of you can pull out, sort of stands alone. It's a story, it's a parable, it's something else. It's a little section, even though it may not, it may be in the same book or the same chapter. Starting with verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming. Here's where Jesus makes his appearance, and John identifies him as the man who. Um, is the one he has been telling them to look for. That continues down through um, verse 36, where he says, look the Lamb of God, where John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. And then we have the disciples beginning to follow Jesus, being identified as disciples. And that carries us through with various of the disciples being identified all the way down to the end of the first chapter. So, roughly speaking, and you could draw the line in a couple of different places, but it's the... The theological prologue, then we have the interrogation of John about his baptism, who he is. Then you have Jesus being identified as the Lamb of God by John, where John points to Jesus saying, this is the one I told you who was coming. And then you have the story of the disciples, some of whom had been followers of John, the, John the Baptist. Some of the followers of John the Baptist, when John the Baptist says, there's the Lamb of God pointing at Jesus and saying, He's the one I told you was coming. Some of them, Andrew and others, begin to follow Jesus. So you have the first of the disciples coming to him. Right? So it's helpful to sort of break it down that way in terms of location and in terms of uh, major threads of events. Does that make sense? Now you could have done all of that. Nothing I just told you required theological training. All you have to do is pay attention. Right? Okay, that gives you the context. Any other thoughts about the context there? You know who wrote it. You know to whom it was written. You know what it's about. You know approximately when it was written, um, where it takes place, etc. You've got as much context as we can have for this writing. And again, all of that's available to you, both from either the text or from a, the study Bible, a basic, any sort of Bible introduction you have. Bob? How do we know that this was written to Gentile believers for this passage? Well, um, how do we know that it was written to Gentile believers? Okay. That introduction is for the whole book. The way that we know that uh, John and to a certain extent um, Mark were written, were written by Jewish men to Gentile believers is because whenever they refer to... Um, a Jewish event, like if they talk about the Passover or they talk about some other Jewish uh, 
cultural, they explain what it is. They'll say, and this is the time of year when the Jews celebrate blah, 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 or when they recognize da, da, da. If they were writing to Jews, like Matthew did, they wouldn't have done that. So we know that the expectation John had is that probably this would have a wide readership, but some of them would be Gentiles. They would not know what he was talking about when he talks about specifically Jewish stuff unless he explains it to them. But it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but there will be general explanations for that. Okay? And some of it has to do with terminology, too. You know, Matthew is full of uh, references to um, <coughs> sort of messianic references that would have been very, very much Hebrew or Jewish rather than Greek even though it's written in the Greek language, okay? All right, that gives us the context. That's the first step. Now we want to actually get into the passage to get into what, what the thing says to us. The second level, which we have up here, is the observation level. What does the passage say? <coughs> this is where we get more in, into, like up above we had, okay, who wrote it, to whom was it written, when was it written, where was it written? But here, looking at the text itself, we want to try to answer the sort of who, what, where, when, why, how questions. The first, first part of this, I think, is who are the main characters? Who are they? John the Baptist and Jesus. John the Baptist, Jesus. Anybody else? Well, the disciples, those who became the apostles who were following him, they're mentioned lightly, that's sort of second tier. What's that? The Gentiles. Okay, the Gentiles. Um, where do you get the Gentiles in this passage? Being mentioned in this passage? Well, it, it, there are people, not exactly mentioned, but there are people asking him questions, so I assume that they were Gentiles. Okay, it's, I think it specifically says Jesus' testimony about the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites. So I think everybody, in terms of characters that are introduced at this point, are probably Jewish. You do have the priests and the Levites. Those are characters. We don't have a proper name for them, but they are included in here as characters. And the Pharisees. Right? And, the Pharisees. and the Pharisees, exactly. And they mention those separately, which is interesting. Um, the Levites would have been the tribe of Levi, where from which the priests were taken. The priests would be those who actually were serving as priests at the time. And then the Pharisees would have been, they were the fundamentalists of their day. Okay, They were the Bible humpers. Um, who else? What other characters might be mentioned here? Uh, Philip, Nathaniel, Philip, Peter. Andrew, and Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, right? Andrew. What's all this word stuff? God. God, okay. God gets mentioned. In fact, um, well, let's keep going with that. What? So we've got the characters. Jesus is mentioned. Um, God. John the Baptist, the priests and Levites, the Pharisees, Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, all of those are worth making note of. Those are all characters. Those are who that appear in this first chapter. What about key words? Particularly if they're words that are repeated. Repeated words, or I'm going to get to key phrases in a minute. Repeated words or repeated phrases or repeated concepts are always critically important to know. What words are key here? Is this, something that, like, is this something that you would like underline? Exactly. In fact, if you want to, I, I've got this little chart here. I would recommend to you, in fact, I'll show you. I did this. When I started out with this, I wrote who, what, where, when, why, and how in the sides, and under who I wrote the word, God, uh, you know, and then I, I got really into all the different references for Jesus. Which is what something I'm going to get you to bring you to in a minute, you know, in terms of what what does it mean? But yes, you can be circle the names of those people. Go through and, and circle them with this text. And you know what? If you circle them in your Bible, if you would rather have a piece of paper, the ink is not going to leak through and all that kind of stuff. Remember, I told you you can go on BibleGateway.com and cut and paste whole pages. You can make them 27, 28 point type if you want to make that easier to read. And just print them out on basic paper, and you got you can scribble and write and mark and you know do whatever you want to with it. If you're reluctant to do that in your in your actual Bible, okay? Which is what I've given you here. The name of that website. BibleGateway.com. BibleGateway, all one word. .com. 
there are others too. I mean, there are a lot of places on, on the internet that you can go and copy passages of scripture. But um, so I circled all the different people that are in here. When we talk about keywords, I went through and started circling these. Now, what, what other keywords are there? We mentioned word. Light. Light. Messiah. What's that? Messiah. Messiah. Life. Life. Baptism. What's that? Baptism. Baptism. Lamb of God. Lamb of God. Now that gets me something. When I started looking at key words, one of the things that occurred to me is one of the characters, obviously, is Jesus. And Jesus is not mentioned in the first 14 verses by name. The first 14 verses are the theological prologue. So how do we know that's Jesus? What does the text say? He was with God in the beginning. He was with God in the beginning. We believe that theologically, but it goes even further. He, he verse, was, what does verse 14 say? The flesh. Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and, and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, Father full of grace and truth. And then the very next passage that we have is John testifies concerning Him. And it goes, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. They begin to name him starting uh, immediately after this theological prologue. But when you realize he's talking about Jesus, go through here. And one of the things I did was I circled Jesus is called the Word. It said he was God, so he's called God. Um, there are a lot of pronouns, hymns and things like that. He's called the Light. He is um, Messiah. What else is he called? The one and only. True light is also used. Lamb of God, etc., etc. I mean, you could spend months and months and months just thinking about and studying and working on all the different references to Jesus in this first 14 verses and what they all mean. He is the light of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He is... The same as God. You see why this is the theological prologue, okay? All right. Um, so those are some of the key words. What are some of the key phrases? Um, light, Groups of words. Light of the world. Light of the world. Before he became flesh. He be before he became flesh. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. What are the first three words? In the beginning, that's repeated. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word God. He was with God in the beginning. Where else have you heard that? Genesis 1, the first verse in, in the Bible. John is very being very intentional about echoing the first verse of the Bible, which identifies the beginning of all things that, that we know. Jesus was present at the beginning of all things. In fact, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, any other key phrases? I baptize with water. Okay, I baptize with water. He baptizes with fire and the Holy Spirit. Um, light shines in darkness, but the darkness is not comprehended in. Those are powerful things. See, this is not the easiest text I could have started you on. We could have taken Jonah 1, which is great, but it's easy. Who's there? Okay, God, Jonah, the fish, the sailors. All right? This is critically important stuff for our faith. I would go so far as to say that the, the majority of the doctrinal basis for our Christian faith is found in these four, first 14 verses. Because it's all about Jesus. In fact, it's a fairly safe bet that if you don't ask any other question when you say, what does the passage say, you can ask yourself, what does it say about Jesus? Any passage. What does this tell me about Jesus? Okay. All right, key phrases. In the beginning was with God and was God. The light shines in the darkness. He, the children of God, he's the one and only. What are some of the key concepts? It's a little harder. What are some of the key concepts? To testify. Like okay. To, to, be the te to be the testimony of what was being before. I mean, that he's the fulfillment. To testify. Okay. That, that John is there to testify for Jesus? Witness to testify. Okay, witness to testify? His divinity. And divinity. His discipleship. His introduction to, to public ministry. Okay. Those are key concepts. 
look at the first five verses. Let me limit this for you. What are the concepts that you can draw out from just the first five verses? In the beginning was the Word. What concept is in that? He was eternal. Co-eternal with the Father. Well, and in that point you get He's eternal. He has always been. Mm -hmm. One of the first and biggest heresies of the church was that Jesus the Son was created by the Father. No, not according to John. In the beginning was the Word. Okay? What else do we know? He was the maker of all things. Okay, well first, you're right. But first was with God, and what else? The Word was, was God. Was God. Jesus is co-eternal as part of God. He was with God the Father, is what we take from that. And He was God. He is divine. It's not a matter of, well, He's like God. There's a really good guy. He is God. And He has always been God. Ron? It's interesting. Was God, past tense, because now He's in the world. Well, he still is, but remember the context here is in the beginning. So he's talking about a past, of it, a past um, setting. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he brings it, later on, he brings it up to, the, to his present time. It's not like he was God and he's not anymore, in other words. He's talking about a past uh, situation being described here. All right? So he was in the beginning. He's eternal. He was with God. He was God. He is divine. He was with God in the beginning. What does verse 3 say? John, you said this already. Uh, he was the maker of all things. Through Him all things were made. Jesus, the Word, was the part of God through whom creation occurred. Now, that sort of makes sense if you think. go back to Genesis 1, and it says, In the beginning was the... Well, I'm sorry. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it says... And the Lord God said, what happens when you say something? What do you say? Let there be. Well, but you say words. Palabras. Okay? When you speak, you speak words. When God said, he spoke the word, and by the power of the word, things came into being. If you link that Genesis 1 with God speaking the word, and it was so, creation occurred, with the fact that it was through the Word, through Him, the Word, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. You see, Jesus was present as the co-eternal Word of God at creation. It was through the speaking of the Word that, the, that God created everything. Do you see how this and Genesis 1 fit together? Is everybody clear on that? And you're considering this the key of action? Um, the next phrase here, on your sheet. Yeah, okay. Um, key concepts, key actions. Well, key action is creation. Right. Yes. You know, there. Um, when you get to key actions, the first key action is creation. The second one is testimony. You know, there came a man sent from God, his name was John, and he witnessed. He was a testimony. And then you have the incarnation. The word became flesh. Those are the major actions, I think, here. But I think you can see, in Him was, well, verse 4, let's keep going with that. In Him, the Word, the co-eternal Word through whom creation occurred, in Him was what? Life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Jesus is the light of the world. Okay? But we don't get it. That, you know, the description of the human condition. Bless you. Um... Do you see how much stuff is in here? And you know, notice we have not asked any other commentator what they thought about this. If you just, I, I, I've been feeding you some of this, granted, but if you just read the text, all of that is in there. If you spend time with it. One of the things that K. Arthur says is that the first, key, first and foremost key to the, all of this is you have to slow down enough to pay attention to what it really says. Okay. One of the things that I think is helpful in slowing you down and seeing what it really says is my next recommendation under key actions, and that is to write out the passage in your own words. If you were to take these first 14 verses and write them out in your own words, 
what would it sound like? I mean, if I were to do this, just off the top of my head, it would be, Jesus, the Son of God, has always existed. He not only was with God in the beginning, but He actually is God. And it was through Him that everything gets made. And He is the light of the world. That even though people don't understand it, that's the light they're looking for. That light was testified to by John, whom God sent to let people know about Jesus before he came. Jesus then came into the world, was born as a baby, and became a human being so that we could perceive the reality of his glory. And that was the way in which he could save us, because he is God himself who came to save the world. That would be my version of that. You would have your own version. Writing it in your own words is a, is a wonderful way to make sure you understand what it's saying. I used to, when I used to teach preaching, I told first year students that until you are ready, and this, is, this is a variant of what I just said, I said until you're ready to tell me what your whole sermon is about in one sentence, you're not ready to preach that sermon. Well, when we get to the point, similarly, not exactly the same, but when we get to the point where we can take a passage like this and write what we, you know, write our own version of it in our own words, then you know what it says. And it's a wonderful thing to do. Questions about that? Oh, but I do have a question. Is it possible to cut and paste this into an email? Form? Yeah, I can, I can send it. It's, it's actually online. Uh, it's, it's in the notes. But I will do it as a Word document and put it back up online today so that you, you when you go into the website, you can download this as a clean Word document. Yeah. All right, it's five minutes after two. We're going to take a break for six minutes. At 11 minutes after, I'm going to call you all back together. So take a break. Okay, let's go on to the next section. We've done the context for the passage, the observation, what does the passage say? And you could do a lot more with that. Um, and there are no... The answers need to be what you find in the passage. I started to say there are no right answers, but there are right answers and there are wrong answers. If you said, well, you know, this passage is talking about Marduk, the great god of the Ammonites, and you know, <laughs> blah, 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 then that's a wrong answer. But still, the point of this is what is God, the, if you prayerfully approach this, what is God saying to you? What, do you what, is, what are you understanding that this passage says? And if you approach this in a, in a humble and a godly, a prayerful way, then God will guide you in that. We believe you're not in this all by yourself, okay? So, but now let's go on to the next phase. We've talked about what is it, what's the context and what does it say, but now the interpretation phase, which is on the back of your sheet, which is what does the passage mean? I read a little bit about what it said, and actually in my enthusiasm, I got into some of what it means, because this is a good process to walk you through it, but the more you do this, the more it's going to all sort of happen at one time. Because as you read the passages, you're going to start thinking about here's what it says and here what it means. It's all going to start coming out simultaneously. Now he's already doing some of that for you in terms of the meaning of the word and how it relates to Genesis and all that. Okay, so forgive me for that. Uh, but when we look at what the passage means, here are some questions. They are not the only questions. They are not the perfect questions. They are some questions to help guide you. Is it on? Was it off during the break? <laughs> Does anybody else want to run the camera from now on? <laughs> no, John, I'm teasing. Thank you. It's not a problem. No, we're good. Um, so the first question, which is similar to a question we asked in the context, is why was this book written? What is the purpose? In order to understand the meaning, why was it written, Carrie? I'd say that, to say that Jesus was always part, always of God and introduce him to the flesh Jesus. Okay, to introduce the eternal Jesus, who was always part of God, and the fact that he became human for us. Okay, I think that's good. Um, to witness to Jesus, to tell about his life and ministry, the fact that he is God. He's not just another teacher. Okay. What, was the what is the major theme or purpose of this? Very similar, what's the message? Do you, maybe the answer is the same for that. Do you have anything else on that? Major theme or message, Jesus, I have, Jesus is the eternal Messiah who came to save us. Alright? Basically the same thing. These are all questions to help you dig into it. You may not have answers to all of them, or some of them you may have the same answer. 
Third question, why does the, what does the author want us to know or to understand? In other words, if you, if you sat John down here, John the writer of this, John the Apostle, not John the Baptist, and said, John, tell me in one sentence why you wrote this book. What do you think his answer would be? Well, to testify that Jesus was the Word, and if you believe in Him, you would be saved. Okay, to testify Jesus is the Word, if you believe in Him, you would be saved. John, do you have something else? Yes, sir. Uh I would think, you know, when you see John the Baptist and he's got this big crowd of men that follow him and then finally he sees the Lamb of God and he points his men to them, I would think that the, the, the whole message would be, this is one worth following. Okay, this is one worth following. That John the Apostle is saying that the, John, the, the Jesus that John the Baptist identified as the Lamb of God is the one to be followed because yes. he is the worthy one. Okay. Why did the author emphasize the things he did? For instance, especially in those first 14 verses that you've got in front of you. Um, that Jesus always was part of God. Okay, that Jesus always was part of God. Part of the foundation. Part of the foundation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Carolyn? I think it's about believing and becoming God's child. It, it, especially when you relate it to the end of the passage where it's all about coming follow. Right, okay, um, to believe and become um, God's child. Becky? Um, I think he was really wanting to connect that, he, that Jesus, the one that was coming, the one who had arrived, was divine. Okay. That he had arrived, the Messiah, the divine one had arrived. All right, that the divine one, the Messiah, who was with, with God and was God, had arrived. John? That's the same thing. That, okay. that was the basis for which he would build everything else in his letter, in his book, you okay. know, was over this one thing. You don't get that right, then, you know, the people wonder, well, why should I follow this guy? Nothing else makes sense, right. Um, is the tone or style of the first 14 verses the same as the rest of the book? No. 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 How is it different? Because it's more explaining. He's more personal later on. Okay. With, with more of a narrative and, later on. More of a narrative later on. Starting with verse 15, that's where John the Baptist is there, and then these guys come out to ask him questions about stuff. I mean, you know, it, it's, it presents Jesus, and then they come out. So it gets into sort of a telling of events. But the first 14 verses are very different because, um, and it's sort of in the same way as I said in the beginning, John is in echoing Genesis 1 very clearly. In the same way that the creation story is talking about something that really happened, but it does it in this huge poetic imagery. All right, um, I think John is trying to capture some of the same scope and scale uh, when talking about Jesus as being the co-eternal Word who was with God and was God and through whom all things were made. He's trying to capture some of that same bigness as the language in Genesis 1. And he spends 14 verses doing that. By the way, the verses were not added until like 1500. There were not verses originally. <coughs> Verse numbers, I mean. Um, he, it's a theological prologue because he's setting the stage in the biggest possible language, the, a gigantic kind of idea. And then, that's, the con, that's sort of the, the context, the environment in which all of the events of Jesus' life and John the Baptist's life and everything else, all of that is sort of ref a reflection of the giant importance of the first 14 verses. See that? Okay. Um, what is unclear about the meaning in this passage for you? Does it, uh, Bob? One thing that's unclear to me is verse 18. Okay. It says no one has ever seen. Verse 18. Yes. It says no one has ever seen God. But didn't Adam and Eve see God? Didn't Enoch see God? Didn't Abraham see God? Well, Abraham didn't see God. Moses was only allowed to see him from the backside. And Joseph said he's always been in a cloud of smoke. Well, um, you're you're right. There are biblical characters who, um, but in the case of the prehistoric prologue. You know, which is Noah and Adam and Eve and, you know, all of that. Um, I don't know, 
I answer that? It's a good question. This, there, there's one of two ways to, to that it, it might be, and I don't know which of these is right. It's a good question. In fact, I would write that question down, and then I'd go looking to find an answer. That's the point of this. Um, either it is a uh, hyperbolic statement. Hyperbolic means you speak in hyperbole. You speak in extremes in order to make a point. To say no one has ever seen God, you know, um, would be like saying... Um, no one has. Well, no, but I, I'm trying to think of a hyperbolic comparison to like, I have never lied in my whole life, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> okay, I have. <laughs> but people say things like that as hyperbole. You know, I'd give a million bucks for a car like that. It could, it could be this too, Ross. Uh, you know, you've seen my wife, but you haven't seen my wife like I've seen her. Yeah. You know, well, and that's a big difference. So intimacy and, and fellowship and that. Sort and there may be some other meanings. I mean, I'll get there. But so one option is it may be hyperbole. Uh, in the same way that Jesus said, be perfect even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. I used that one earlier in a conversation we talked about. Jesus doesn't actually expect us to be as perfect as God the Father. But he used, speaks in hyperbole in order for us to realize a bigger objective. You know, the old thing about, well, be as perfect as you can be. If you're seeking to try to be perfect like the Father in Heaven is perfect, you're going to end up better than if you didn't try to be perfect. So it may be hyperbole to say no one has ever seen God. It may also be true to say that, you know, God may have represented himself in some way to people because he told Moses, no one can see my face and live. In fact, um, C.S. Lewis in in meditation on the Beatitudes. One of the Beatitudes is, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. Well, C.S. Lewis said, the pure in spirit will see God because they're the only ones that can see God and not be destroyed. All right? So, there's a lot in that. I don't have a better answer than that for it. It may be what John is saying is true, that there may be degrees of seeing, you know, the experience. But that's a question to write down and then look for an answer for. It. Didn't his face a bright light so that you couldn't see his face? Yeah. Well, we don't know. We don't that. know. <coughs> no. That's what he said in the Bible. Yeah, well, it talks about you know that, that there is a, a brilliance. Brilliant. In fact, uh, Paul, um, Moses, we talked about the fact that when he was in God's presence, not allowed to see his face, we're told, but he ended up with his face glowing. From that. I told you all that the famous Michelangelo and some others, but especially the famous uh, sculpture of Michelangelo of Moses. He has horns. And the reason is because in that time period they misinterpreted the reference in the ancient Hebrew which said that when Moses came down from meeting with God, there were rays coming out of his face, out of his head, out of his face. Meaning he was radiant. He actually wears a veil at one point because he's freaking everybody out because his face is glowing. Well, they misread the Hebrew instead of saying rays were coming out of his face. They thought it said horns. And so the most famous sculptor we have, Michelangelo of Moses, he's got horns. Okay, so there, there's a lot there. But the point is, write that question down. You know, what does that mean? And in fact, you know, we will, I'll give you an example. Um, some things that we, the text does not give us clear answers to. Verse 18, I, I haven't read this before. Since no human being can see God as he really is, those who saw God saw him in a form he took upon himself temporarily for the occasion. Now therefore Christ has made him known. Okay, there's the footnote in the NIV study Bible. That's one explanation, but it's got other passages you can read. Yes? Well, I was going to say, maybe the God that Adam and Eve saw and the God that Enoch saw, maybe it was not God the Father, maybe it was God Jesus. Well... Yeah, we don't know. I mean, that, I've never heard it, that idea presented and haven't thought about that. But that God presented himself in some form so they could understand. For one thing, it says, the scripture says God is spirit. He took some bodily form when he was walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. We don't know what that was. So, but you've just gotten to a thing. If you have a question, write the question out. And then once you have finished working through the text, to then go to like your study Bible, to look at the footnotes, which I just read to you, which gives one explanation for that, to look at the cross-references. We, we went through all this last week, so you all know what those things are and how to use them, right? No, because I wasn't here. <laughs> um, were you here, Larry? Can you share? Oh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, 
Well, the footnotes are obvious. The cross references, if you look in the center column, all those okay. little tiny letters That's in the center the column. I need to know that. If you read um, like verse 18, if you go to the center column, it's got 118, and it says, look up Exodus 3320. You see that? Uh -huh. Exodus 3320, John 646, Colossians 115, uh, 1 Timothy, Timothy 616. 1 John 4.12, John 3.16 and 18, 1 John 4.9. All of those scripture passages will refer to that passage that says, you know, no one has seen God. Okay? That's why those center column references are there. So that when you have a question like that, we can chase it down. All right? Bob. What about verse 28 when he's talking, John's trying to explain who he is. And he says, among you stand one you do not know. And he's next says that he's the one who comes after me. Right? Well, John had already said, one is coming after me. John has already said, I baptize you now with water, but there's one coming after me. Um, and he's presented all along, both he presents himself and, and as being the forerunner. John the Baptist was the one who went ahead to prepare the way. The one who came after him is Jesus. And when Jesus says, um, the the passage you're looking at again is which passage? Which verse? 28. 28. No. Um, can't be it says, unless you stand one you do not know. What verse is that? That's not, it's not, yeah, 20, it's not 28. No? 26 and 26. 26. 26. I've ta baptized with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Which means, Jesus is there. I mean, because in verse 28, 29, Jesus walks up. So John is saying, there's one here, somebody is here already that you haven't recognized him for who he really is. That's what it means, one you do not know. You haven't recognized him for who he really is. He's the one who comes after me. John was the, the, the uh, advance man. He was the guy who went ahead to prepare the way. The thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Now those are the right questions. I just gave you the answer, but I'm not gonna be there next time, okay? That's not a prophetic statement about my mortality or anything like that, I hope. Um, but what you do is, well, let's, let's do that right now. That's verse 26. If you go in your study Bible to verse 26, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. untie. You go down to 25, 27, sandals I'm not worthy to untie. There's no footnote on 26. But if we go to the cross references, it says Mark 1 4. So if I go to Mark 1 4, Mark 1 4 says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the footnote is. Mark, like John, had no nativity narrative, but begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. This is also where Peter begins in his proclamation of the gospel. The name John means, and it goes on. Um, it describes the difference of the baptism kind of thing. And then there are cross-references from that. You can go to Matthew 3, 1, John 1, 26, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so follow it up. If you've got a question like that, you don't understand what it means, write down the question so you don't forget what the question was. And then, look at the footnotes, look at the cross-references. If the cross-references take you to a parallel passage in one of the other Gospels or somewhere else in Scripture, read that passage, read the footnotes of that passage, read the cross-references of that passage. You, the important thing here, with the exception of the footnotes, at, most of what we're doing with that is we're letting the Scripture explain the Scripture. We're letting the Bible explain the Bible, not asking some scholar who may or may not have a right understanding of it. Okay? So that's the, we're focusing more on the process today than we are giving me giving you answers, or should be, me giving you answers or questions in John 1. All right? So any questions that you have, and there will be questions, even if your question is, what does this mean? Or a statement, I don't understand this passage. Even if that's it, write it down, and then do some work. That's why I made those of you in, in the... the Degree or uh, certificate programs, I made you buy one of these. 
Now, if, if you didn't get, I've still got a couple of them. If any of you aren't in the degree or certificate programs and you want one, you can get one from me or you can get one on your own. But that's why you want this is because it's got that material right there. You don't have to buy a bunch more books or go to the library or whatever because human nature being what it is, if it's here in one place, you're 99.6% more likely to look stuff up than if you have to go somewhere else for it. Okay? Any other questions? That anybody that comes to mind for reading this for anybody. All right. Well, if, if questions come up, so you write them down. So this gets at what does this passage mean? You write out your questions. You look for the answers. And again, ultimately, the question is: when we say what does this passage mean? What does what do we learn about Jesus from this? Not just what does it tell us about Jesus that you know, but what do we learn about Jesus? That's another way to think about that. Then we get to. The next passage, which the section, which is, um, I've added this. Most of them have three. They say observation, interpretation, application. I think there's too big a jump in there. I think that when I look at scripture and I say, what does this mean? That's a fairly objective thing. In other words, that, what does this mean? What does this mean about Jesus, etc.? Before I get to applying it to my life, I have to decide, what does it mean to me? All right? If, I, if I've looked at this passage... The, the first 14 verses especially of uh, John 1. And it says, I've decided what it says is that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's talking about Jesus, and Jesus was, has always existed, and He was with the Father, and He is God, and He made everything, and then He came to earth in flesh. That's what that all, that all means, is that Jesus is eternal. He is the Son of God. He is the one who saves us. All that's there. Before I start talking about applying it to my life, I think I need to ask the question, is there any part of that that I need to, I need to take more seriously? Have I, have I, do I really believe, do I really think Jesus was the divine son? Do I really think he has always existed? Do I really think he came into the world to be the light for all people? Do I really think that? I have to decide what that means for me before I decide how I'm going to apply it to my life. I think there's too big a jump in the way K. Arthur and some other folks do that. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. If I said, this is what it says and what it means is this, this is what it means about Jesus, I have to decide what I'm going to do with what, what I, where I am in that. I've never, I've never really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making this up now. If, if I said to myself, yeah, I understand now that that's what it says, but I've never really um, dealt with the fact that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who came into the world to save everybody, if that was what I said to myself, it's not, by the way, then, then I would, you know, then I better, I better decide that before I then decide what I'm going to do about it. Okay? That's why I think we need to do meditation. What does it mean to me? Some of the questions there is, what struck me most about this passage? In other words, if the Holy Spirit is going to is going to punch me in the gut on something when I read a passage. Maybe that's something I really need to pay attention to. What are the questions that I ask during our Bible study on Fridays? Put a passage up there and I'll say, what jumps out at you about this? What strikes you about this? Why do I do that? Because different things strike different people. Different things strike different people. What else? To make you think. Particularly because I believe this isn't just a book. I believe this is God's Word, and He wrote it for you, and you, and you, and you, and me. And so when we read a passage of Scripture, one of the things we have to pay attention to is, what strikes me about that? It could be a word, a thought, a concept, uh, a, a question. I believe the Holy Spirit speaks to us by what jumps out at us. And so here, when I say, what struck me most about this passage under meditation, that gets at what God might be telling me here. So the real question is, what is God telling me, me, Ross, about this passage? Not the world, not the instituto. When I read a passage of scripture, what is God trying to tell me about this? What does God seem to be telling me here? How does this passage strengthen or encourage or convict me? If you read something here and you would, eh, if that's true, I have a problem. 
or praise God that's true. Everything I believe is built on that. Or this helps me in something I've been struggling with in terms of my faith walk. Or whatever. If it, if it encourages you or strengthens you or convicts you, identify that as being particular to what God is telling you in that passage. Fair? What questions, again, back to that question, what questions does this raise in my mind? For me, like, well, if that's true, then that means I, if that's true, I have to change some things about my life. Because it sounds like the way I'm living, I'm speaking, <laughs> I'm speaking um, metaphorically here, I'm speaking as examples, not true. Uh, I'm not really convicted that my life is really screwed up. And I can't it. But if I read this and I say, this is what it said, this is what it clearly means, if, if that's the case, then is there, is there something in my life that has to change? This is, I'm not okay. Today, in the book of Acts, in our Bible study, we were looking at the passage in Acts 19, I think it is, where um, after Paul had preached in Ephesus, and it said, and many people have become believers, but later they realized that they needed to change and they brought, they were practicing sorcery and they brought all of their um, magic scrolls and burned them. Now, this was later, this was after they got saved. And it says the value of the magic scroll, the sorcery scrolls that they burned was 50,000 drachmas. Well, a drachma was one day's wage. So that was 50,000 days worth of pay. That would be lifetime earning for probably three people that they burned because once they, they had accepted Jesus, but then they realized afterwards, this means I have to change. If you read a passage of scripture and you realize what it says and you figure out what it means, do you then say, that being the case, there's something about me that needs to be different. God is speaking to me about this. Becky? What really strikes me about this is how John the Baptist was the chosen one to announce this great king in the world. And then when Jesus shows up, he's not like John the Baptist. He's not this wild-looking man. He walks up, he has all this glory, comes upon him. An immediate attraction that people just drop things and follow him. Right. I mean, he had a, this huge presence. Yeah. That just, he walked by, he imagined just walking by someone and going, Oh, I want to follow you. I mean, he had a, this godly presence that was just right. all over him. That was just it's so crazy. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so that I think is, is what does it mean to me, the meditation part. If this says this, if this means this, what does it mean to me and my life? Then we get to application. What do I then do with that? See, I can decide, well, this, this affects me and my life and how I live, but then I have to decide to do something about it. That's a different step. So application, how do I apply this to my life? Some of the questions that you might ask are, um, what has God taught me through this? What aspects directly relate to me and to my life? How do I need to change based upon what I've learned? What does God want me to do differently now than before I understood this to be true? Does this mean I have to burn my sorcery scrolls? Okay, or what is it? Um, what immediate actions should I take? And one way to get at this one, the application part is, when you look at the, these passages of Scripture, are there any com clear commands? Are there any clear promises? Are there any solutions to problems? <coughs> that are depicted in these passages. Commands, promises, solutions to problems. Then those are things that we can look at and go, how do I apply that to my life? How, do I, how can I be obedient to that command in my life? How can I claim that promise in my life? How can I take the solution that those people received to their problem and apply it to the difficulties I'm having in my life? That's the application side. What does God want you to do with this? Now that you've seen what it says, you figured out what it means. You figured out what it means to you. What do you then do, do with it in terms of changing your life? Remember, what's the goal of this Bible study? Transformation, Transformation not just information. Okay. Um,
And ultimately, how do I apply this to my life? The question is, um, how does this affect my relationship with Jesus? Because the goal is for us to grow closer to Him and more like Him. That's the reason we are still in this world. To grow to love the Father more and to love our, the people we are meeting in our lives more. Jesus said those were the two most important things. And he, he gave us that as a model. He acted that out in His life. He loved God. He loved the people around Him. And we are supposed to grow more like Him in that regard. So how does this do that for us? Questions about that? I sort of stole your thunder. I, I stopped letting you answer the questions. I just took over there. Uh, Joanne. Um, I think this last part, part of the application just reminded me when I had um, rededicated my life to the Lord in my 40s. Well, I had established all these friends and colleagues, etc. And I'm thinking, and my husband, I mean, we were, you know, we believed in God, but we weren't following him. I thought, do I have to give him up? Do I have to give all my friends up? I struggled mm -hmm. with that. You know, and God was convicted. He's like, but I don't want to give him up. I don't, I don't. I, it was a long process for me to understand. And I think that's hard to explain to other people. Yeah. You know, that, no, you don't have to stop one life and start a new life. It, it happens very gently. Right. And there's a lot in Scripture about that. You know, people, people ask Paul, pe people who became believers in Jesus whose spouse we're not Christians. And they asked Paul, do I have to leave or divorce my spouse? And Paul gave a very clear answer. He said, well, if they leave you because you're a follower of Christ, then, then that's okay. But no, stay with them. As far as it's within your power, stay in that relationship. And God will use that. I had a good friend, uh, Michael Rice, in college, and when he had become a Christian in high school, he played a harmonica, jazz, um, jazz harmonica, really beautifully. And he loved jazz music. And he said that before he became a Christian, music had been like his whole life. And he had put together this, back when it was vinyl, you know, record albums. He said, I had thousands of jazz albums, some of them really old and really valuable, and I loved these things. In fact, I loved him so much that when I got saved, somebody told him that you need to get, destroy that stuff because that's an idol in your life. And so he did. And I met him years later when he had grown mature in the faith. And he went, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know, I didn't have to destroy that stuff. I had to change my heart. I didn't have to destroy the vinyl. You know, and sometimes we, we get that wrong. But the point underneath that, and to your, you know, to your credit... Uh, Joanne, is that you knew it was serious. You took it seriously and said, if this is true, and I now believe it is, then it has to change me. It has to change the way I live. Everything in Scripture should be true for us about that. And this process, hopefully, <laughs> will help you get there to where you don't just sort of either, worst of all, don't read it, or just read it lightly, uh, don't get into it. But it will help you hopefully in kind of a, a methodical, systematic kind of way begin to take passages of Scripture and seriously look at them in terms of what do they say, what do they mean, what do they mean to me, and how do I apply it to my life for the purpose of God making you more of what He wants you to be. That's the whole point. And the more we become what God wants us to be, the more joy we will find in our life because we will become more what our heart of hearts wants us to be too. Um, questions about any of that? Yes, uh, first Mary and then Joanne. It's not a question, but um, when my my uh, mother had friends who would travel, and they would bring her back little souvenirs of like uh, little the gods and pieces gods, uh, main gods and stuff, like a cultural mm -hmm. library that she had. And when she became a Christian, she said. Um, what do you think of this stuff? It's starting to make me feel uncomfortable. Well? And I said, well, if it's if you're not enjoying them, you know, put them in a box and give them away or something. And she got rid of everything like that, and she said, I do feel better. Good. Well, and that's, that's, if the Spirit was speaking to her that this is something she needed to do, then she needed to be obedient to that. Um, I mean, if 
it's only a thing. Yeah, it's she wasn't worshiping them. Right. Because they had this whole library. Of right. I mean, you know, there there are spiritual powers in the world. So whatever. My friend Michael. I mean, it's, it was easy for him years later to say, "Why did I destroy all my jazz albums?" Because I, you know, uh, because he still loved music and things. But. Um, if he had, if that still had been the most important thing in his life, if his music had continued to be more important than Jesus, and the and the vinyl had kept him there, then it should have been destroyed. Right? Something doesn't have to be inherently wicked, like the sorcery scrolls, you know, which are inherently wicked, for them to be a problem for us. Okay, um, we, our, our gods or our houses or our gardens or our pets can become our gods if we let them. The, the old thing about uh, your God is whatever you think about most. Okay? And that, that may be that as we read scripture, it says to us that there is something in our lives, in any particular scripture, that has become too important to us. And it's becoming a barrier to us making the, you know, there's only one throne in our lives. And either God is on it or something else is on it. We have to decide what that is. Joanne, you had something? Um, yes, I just... It's good to read this and have this and submit to my own mind. I've always struggled with the church periodically would say, oh, just read the Bible one year and this is how you do it. I can never get it done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't get that. Then it's a book. And, and yeah. I couldn't do that. And it, it always made me feel a little bit like I wasn't fulfilling something because right. I couldn't do it that way. Well, we're going to talk about some other approaches. I mean, we, we're, we've still got um, four more weeks of this class, and so we're going to talk about some other approaches starting next week. But as I have talked with you, again, the first thing is to just read. And I, and I'm sh I share my experience and my approaches and strategy about stuff. To just read it. Not with the idea that you have to read the whole book in a year, or that you have to, re you have to spend at least an hour a day. You know what? I would rather you spend 15 minutes a day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon than get up at 5.30 every morning and think you have to spend an hour and snore through most of it, or whatever. You need to be honest and realistic, but still committed to doing it. And I'd rather you spend 15 minutes and really read the Bible in a time when you can be there and let it just soak in, pray before, pray after. And then find time, maybe once a week or so, where you go through a process like this where you're actually studying the Word, getting to more of the detail and answers and stuff. Then, then completely fail by trying to fulfill some external set of standards that don't work for you. That you have to read the whole Bible in a year. Or that you, you, know, you have to do X or you have to do Y. That you have to find all the places where God is mentioned and draw a triangle over his name. Okay. <laughs> to do that could be very valuable. You might find that very satisfying to find out how many times. But you know what? If that's going to drive you off and say, man, I just cannot draw any more triangles right now, then don't do that. <laughs> All right, I want to give you one more thing. And Betty, I'm going to call on you again. Okay. This is a different version, and I'm doing this. I'll give those folks, and I'll give these two to Randy and Rosie. This is an even simpler version of that uh, charting paper I just gave you, which the other one is mine. This is one I just took off the internet. And it's about as simple as you can get. Um, I'll wait till you get it. No, I'll mention. I'll tell you what it says. And I'm giving you this to you almost more than anything else to say that there are other ways to do this. And if you're serious about it, then you need to find the way that you're most comfortable with. Start with what I've given you. Work with that. Maybe try to do more of the stuff that Kay Arthur is talking about. But if you need to come up with your own process, your own form, your own whatever, that's okay, as long as you do it. This document, as you can see, is much simpler. It's one side of one sheet. At the top it says, what's the book, what's the chapter? And it's got four columns. We're the key people. What are the key events, words, or themes? What are the key issues or problems? And what are the key exhortation or instructions? In effect, it's like the first two columns are what does it say, the problems, issues and problems are what does it mean, and exhortation instructions are how do you apply it, okay, um, the application. And then at the bottom, what verses, concepts, facts, key ideals really stood out to me? That same thing I said, what is the Holy Spirit? Now, the Holy Spirit poking you about something in here, then you need to pay attention to that. And it may not be anything that any Bible scholar is going to spend a lot of time on, but you need it. 
Um, what do I hear God teaching me? Thank you. From today's teaching, reading, what am I going to do? The application plan. Doesn't get more simple than this. But if you, if, if the other one is too complicated for you, try using this one. Um, the point is, read God's Word, spend time studying it and identifying what does it say, what does it mean, what does it mean to me, how do I apply it to my life. And after you've been doing this for a while, you'll find yourself doing that whenever you read Scripture. Most of my study, I mean, I do, do notes and stuff. Obviously, I write sermons and, you know, Bible studies and all kinds of stuff. And I do that, but most of, of this kind of stuff, just I just naturally do now. I mean, I read a passage of Scripture, and I, without even thinking about it, without looking at a piece of paper or asking, you know, going through a list of questions, you'll find yourself saying, wow, what is this saying? Wow, that's interesting. What does that mean? Boy, that really affects me in terms of this part of my life, and... I think I need to start spending more time in prayer because of what this says, or whatever it is. And you'll find yourself doing that more naturally. But you know what? Before you get there, you need to start using some of this stuff. What's that? These forms are you put them on the website. I will put my form on the website. The other one, well, I think I can the other one too because it says it's free to use. So the website I took it off of. I, I didn't, this one, the first one, I created. The second one, um, I think it's still okay to put up because I'll put a copy of that up on the website as well. So the same place that you get the, the PowerPoint stuff, we'll have these forms up this, as of this afternoon. Okay? And then again, the website, liteachapala.org. Did I even tell you guys about that? Well, you guys are in the other class, but there are people in this oh, class that aren't in the others. We now have a Lakeside Institute of Theology website. It's www.litchapala, no breaks, .org, litchapala.org, and were you able to get into it, Pat? Not that way. I got into it with the HHH. What were you? See, it, that, ought, that ought to automatically, it you, automatically, your browser ought to automatically put in the HTTP, you know, www. I just, I just used what you gave Okay, me. well, you can copy and paste that or... Carolyn? Can we promise that we'll just send a, send a link to people in the email? We will send you an email with the link so you guys can get to it. But um, the on there will be all of the videos, even me doing this, <laughs> uh, all of the videos that you can click on and watch them right there. It also has a link for each class where you just click on that and it will take you to the box.com website, which you're, you all have been accessing already. So all of it will be in one place, thanks to Carolyn. Carolyn created the website for us. Uh, yay, Carolyn. And so we, we're, we're only like one video behind, two as of today. It takes about 24 hours to upload one video, so we're getting that stuff up. And you can, you can see it then. Did you just pull it up? Okay, good. All right. Um, then once you've done all the stuff we talked about, what do the Bible study footnotes say? Well, I started doing this as we went along. Once you've gone through the text itself, and you've done all the, the, what does it mean, what does it say, what does it mean, or what does it say, what does it mean, what does it mean to me, how am I going to apply this? If you've got any questions or anything you want to follow up on, like a very interesting thing would be to take the word. In the beginning was the word. What does the word mean? If in your NIV study Bibles you go to the topical index and you look up word, or you go to the Bible dictionary and look up word, or the concordance, any of those three, and you look up Word, it then gives you other places to look to give you a deeper understanding of what that means. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, hang on a second. If I go to Word of God in the topical index in here, it's got what is the Word of God? And then what power does the Word of God have? Characteristics of God's Word, our reaction to the Word of God, Pictures used for the Word of God. Scripture is the Word of God. And then, point G, Jesus as the Word of God. And it's got John 1, 1, John 1, 3, 1, 14, 1 John 1, 2, Revelation 19, 13 to 16. Um, Revelation is about Jesus as the victorious Word. So, the next tier is you then take any of your questions, any of the words that jumped out at you, anything you really feel prompted to follow up, Use the, the footnotes, any charts or uh, maps that exist in, in your study Bible, 
the key parallel using the, the center uh, cross-reference stuff, and then other helpful information, topical index, dictionary, uh, dictionary of concordance. So then, once you have started, okay, don't go to those, if it's, if it's scripture, that's fine, but the footnotes and some of the other dictionary and some of that, you may be getting somebody else's opinion. Start with what the scripture says to you by the Holy Spirit first, and then go to some other sources. All right, is that clear? Reading for next week. The K. Arthur book, New How to Study Your Bible, pages 99 to 192. It's a small book, and there's a lot of charts and stuff. There's not a lot, you know. And then, and then uh, Rick Warren, page 189 to 270. Lots of charts and things like that. Again, I keep, I keep apologizing to you guys, and I'm asking you to read this stuff. If you had had some of the classes I had, you know, okay, read the 700-page book by next Thursday. Okay. Um, we had a lot of that when I was doing my THM work. We had one major theological book a week, and that wasn't the only class I was taking. Okay. So, don't write. Reading and absorbing in our age is a bit slow. Yeah, that's true. Okay, any questions? Can you go back to the second uh, tier analysis of what to do next? And again, all of this stuff is online. Somebody, uh, I had a couple of messages the last few days about what's the homework. <laughs> the, <laughs> and I, I don't mind responding to that, but please understand that if I get half a dozen of those, which is about how many I got this week, then, then that's, you know, that gets to be quite a bit to respond. I will make sure from now on it's always in the notes, like it is here. This is what got uploaded. Also, uh, when you, if you go looking for the notes to, to, and you don't find them, it's probably because I don't have them up yet. I don't promise that I'm going to have them up before the morning of the class, and that's because I'm working on this stuff during the week. Um, I'm going to try to get everything up the night before, but if you don't find them, that's probably because they're not up there yet. So go back and check later, okay? Any questions about that? Susan. Please do assign next week are finished. Yep. Do you know what the assignments are going to be for the week after that? Uh, I'll let you know. Because I won't do I don't think, I think this is all of the reading. We're then going to do some practicum stuff the rest of the time. And again, for uh, one more thing before you all start doing the rest of your life. Um, I am going to have up on the website a document. And this document is a, an agreement to, for people who miss classes, what I'm going to ask you to do is to sign and give back to me a document that says I'm, these are the dates I missed but I have watched the videos and reviewed the materials and so I'm up to speed. All I'm going to ask you to do is to sign that and give it and date it and give it to me so that I, because I, and I trust you, so that I know that you've done that and included in that it's going to say that you have completed all of that stuff no later than two weeks after the course ends. I don't want somebody coming back to me next April and saying, oh, I just finished the videos for blah, blah, so give me credit for it, because you're not going to remember any of it by that time. So within two weeks of the end of this class, which means by the middle of November, and I'll put the date on there, uh, you have to promise me that you watch the videos and it's been within that period of time, and then I will give you credit for, for that class if you're in a degree or a certificate. Remember, you're only allowed one unexcused absence without making it up, and that's what making it up means. Good? God bless you all. Thank you. We will see you next week.